John, I, I appreciate that kind introduction, and I very much appreciate uh, seeing this wonderful audience out here today uh, while I talk about a very favorite subject of mine. Uh, James Jones, the author of From Here to Eternity, was a veteran of the war in the South Pacific. In the 1970s, he wrote about those battlegrounds, and he called them places that people in the United States mostly never heard of. Today, I'm going to be talking about one of those forgotten battlegrounds, Bougainville, and I'll be showing how many important and stirring events occurred there that are every bit as much worthy of being remembered just the way we remember Guadalcanal. And it's particularly appropriate that I do talk about Bougainville because that is the subject matter on my book cover. And we know who this Marine is. His name is Corporal William Coffrin of Flint, Michigan, and he appears here fighting on D-Day at Bougainville with the 3rd Marine Raider Battalion. Now to understand how Bougainville fits in with the rest of the Pacific War, we have to go back to the early days of the war when command in the Pacific is divided as between General Douglas MacArthur and Admiral Chester Nimitz. Nimitz will then subdivide his command and he appoints Admiral Robert Gormley to command in the South Pacific. However, some months later, during a crisis at Guadalcanal, he loses confidence that Gormley has the right fighting spirit to get through the crisis, and he appoints in his stead someone who is certainly not deficient in that capacity. And this, of course, is Admiral William F. Halsey, known as Bull Halsey, to the press. To his biographer, the great Professor Potter, Halsey was a swashbuckler of the old tradition, and like many swashbucklers, part little boy who never grew up. <laughs> and now, now we have, this is the same area that we have in here. Uh, I'm <coughs> going to point out, just for orientation, here, down here at the lower left, you've got a little bit of Australia that's peeking up, just a little, little smidgen right there. Uh, th here you have the lower half of the island of New Guinea. There's about as much of it that continues upward from there. And if you were continuing a straight line, you'd come to the Philippine Islands in that direction. Out here across the Solomon Sea, you have the chain of the Solomon Islands, the island of Guadalcanal here at uh, the southeast end. Uh, extending up here is the island of New Georgia that figures in our story. Here is Bougainville, the largest of the island chain. Uh, you get the island of New Britain here. Now what's very important about it is the great Japanese base of Rabaul sitting right here at the eastern end. Uh, up here you'll have the Admiralty Islands, which figure a bit in our story later. And if you were to go due north, you'd come to the Caroline Islands and the great Japanese base of Truk. Now here's how the situation stands in January of 1943. MacArthur's forces here at Papua have cleared this area of the Japanese after a very difficult six-month battle. And pretty much at the same time, and also after a difficult half-year battle, Halsey's forces here on Guadalcanal have forced the Japanese to evacuate the island. And so after a year of retreats and holding actions, the Allies are now in a position to go on to the offensive. MacArthur's objective all along is going to be to get himself back to the Philippines, but he can as long as Japanese power is extending here through the South Pacific with all the power radiating out of the central point of Rabaul. MacArthur conceives a plan that is called Cartwheel, a very ambitious plan where in roughly over an eight-month period, 13 separate operations will be conducted, some by his own forces, and here I should say that his own forces are going to be principally Australians at this stage, and some by Halsey's, and they are going to uh, obtain a string of air bases from which they can try to pound down Rabaul. It is thought at that stage of things that it would be ultimately necessary to go into Rabaul and actually capture the place. Unfortunately, that last step does not prove necessary. Now, we're going to, in this course, uh, this uh, session, talk about what's happening on Halsey's side. Uh, Halsey's first step is going to be here moving into New Georgia. And his offensive, as well as MacArthur's, 
kicks off at exactly the same point, the mid-year 1943, June 30th, 1943, our uh, dual offensive gets underway. And while New Georgia is being fought over, planning is already underway for that next leap up in the Solomon's chain to Bougainville. And that brings us to the situation right here. This is Halsey's headquarters on August 15th, 1943. Incidentally, this photo was unknown until I discovered it in the Marine Corps archives. And what is happening here, Halsey is holding an order appointing a new commander for the 1st Marine Amphibious Corps, all abbreviated as IMAC. IMAC is the organization that is going to be conducting the invasion of Bougainville. The outgoing commander is at our left, that is Archer Vandegrift, who made a splendid name for himself as the commander of the 1st Marine Division on Guadalcanal, and in consequence has been slated to become the new Marine Commandant comes the first of the year. Between this point and then, he is going to be going off on a tour of Pacific bases. The incoming commander is seated right here. His name is Charles Barrett. Barrett is, uh, comes from a distinguished Virginia family. Uh, has uh, a fine reputation in the Marine Corps, though he has no combat experience, but that's true of many a Marine at this point in the war. Uh, he is the man who had formulated amphibious core doctrine for the Marines. And uh, most recently, he is the man who trained the 3rd Marine Division, and they are the principal com component of IMAC that is going to be going in there to invade Bougainville. Well, as I said, this is on August, oh, I, I, just before we leave here, I should make mention of this gentleman who will pop up in our story just a little later. This is General Harmon, not to be confused with the General Harmon who is in Europe. He is a commander of the Army and Army Air Forces in the South Pacific. It's an administrative command, not a tactical command. This is on August 15th, 1943. The planning is going forward for Bougainville until October the 8th when something very dramatic occurs. Barrett falls from the window of his headquarters building at Noumea. He's killed. There's a hurried court of inquiry and they reach the conclusion that he died accidentally. I got intrigued in this case eight years ago. I found letters in the Marine Corps archives that had never been seen before that conclusively proved that Halsey had decided to fire him. Had not, it had not yet been announced. He took his own life, and it was decided that they would hold a phony baloney court of inquiry with everybody knowing what result that they wanted. They did not want the truth to out. Uh, the facts are indeed remarkable. I devote my entire 10, uh, chapter 10, to this, including substantial excerpts from the most amazing letters that you will ever see. These are letters that are being exchanged. Uh, some are from Vandegrift himself, uh, writing to the Marine Corps Commandant. And I think it had been supposed all along that no, these letters would never see the light of day. So people are not talking in militaries. They are being very off the cuff in their comments. So if you do read my book, and read chapter 10, do not miss the notes at the end because I packed in as much as I could between the text and the notes. Now, Vandegrift is still out in the Pacific, making his tour preparatory becoming the Marine Commandant, so he is hurriedly called back to stay around long enough to execute the invasion. And here is our target. This is the island of Bougainville, and the area that we have selected to invade is where you see the little arrow here on the west coast. We picked that area for a few different reasons. Number one, we know that there are very few Japanese there. And indeed, when we get there, we'll only find that there's a single Japanese company. The trails into that area are very primitive from both the top end and the bottom end of the, of the island where most of the Japanese are concentrated. And therefore, we know we're gonna get a nice long respite before the Japanese can arrive in strength and attack the perimeter. And of course, we want to build an airstrip and uh, the soil is found conducive to that sort of thing. So these are the factors that make that particular area desirable. 
And then we get certain refinements of the plan. And here is the Treasury Islands. Treasury Islands are very close by. And what makes them attractive to us is that it can be, uh, serve as a good forward supply base. If we can get our foot in there, even before we're in going into Bougainville and get ourselves established there, we can avert a supply crisis like we ran into out in Guadalcanal when it seemed for a while as if we might not even be able to hold on to the place. That would be very convenient. Now, the downside of our doing that is the fact that the way it is aligned with the west coast of Bougainville, we'd be tipping our hands to the Japanese that we have designs on moving against the west coast. And therefore, we get the idea for a raid here at the northern end of the island of Choisil. Uh, we're just going to go in there to try to just uh, shoot things up a little, try to convey the impression that we have a real invasion that's going on there to give the Japanese the idea that we're clearing a path to move against the east side of Bougainville. Here we have a scene at Halsey's headquarters and he's enjoying a cool brew with the New Zealand uh, brigadier who is going to be leading something like 3,500 New Zealanders against something like under 300 Japanese and needless to say we do take the treasuries uh, quite easily. Uh, I love photographs like this that don't get too much play elsewhere and to the greatest extent possible in my book you will find uh, if there's any question I would go with rarity uh, versus uh, a picture that's better. Though in some cases they are very well known pictures, some cases I couldn't uh, uh, avoid that. And next we have here a very youthful looking lieutenant colonel who's going to grow up to be uh, marine uh, legend Victor Krulak. Uh, he uh, conducts a brilliant raid on Choisil, uh, destroys the Japanese barge base, destroys lots of their supplies, and we leave the Japanese guessing as to where our blow is going to fall. And here we are on invasion day. The aircraft is hovering over the principal invasion beaches, as well as that island in the foreground, that is Puruata Island, and that specifically is where the Marine who's on my book jacket is doing his fighting on invasion day. Here we have a lower level photograph of pretty much the same scene. However, we know that this picture must date from at least several weeks later because right here you can see the airstrip at Cape Tarakina that we construct once we are in there. Uh, the, uh, incidentally, this t t is the hot spot during invasion day because you can see cross, you can have a crossfire. Japanese being here and Japanese being here and our boats are, are entering the area in between. So that is where the fighting is happening, principally on invasion day. Here the troops are going down the cargo nets into the Higgins boats, the Higgins boats circling. Here we have the men hitting the beach, and here they are on the beach getting ready to move inland. It's a very successful invasion day, uh, just according to plan. We plan to bring in two regiments of the uh, 3rd Marine Division, and we succeed in doing that. We get most of their supplies out. We incur under 200 casualties, uh, including 88 killed. Now, uh, these are very small numbers compared to some of the numbers that we've come accustomed to in other battles, but this, as a matter of fact, is a little on the high side for landings in the South Pacific. We have large land masses, we can pretty much pick our shots, and most of the time we are going in even without, uh, with either no casualties or just a handful of casualties. But before the end of the day, all our ships clear out of the harbor because word has come down that the Japanese at Rabaul have sent down a force of four cruisers <coughs> to attack our beachhead. They're two light and two heavy cruisers. Opposing them is Admiral Tip Merrill. Tip Merrill has four cruisers but all our cruisers are light cruisers. So we're somewhat outgunned by the Japanese. However, we do have one ace up our sleeve. We have very good radar. The Japanese do have radar, but it's so poor the ad Japanese admiral said that uh, he never even really made use of it. Well, the battle is called the Emper Battle of Empress Augusta Bay. And here we see what that uh, action looked like from the flagship of uh, Admiral Merrill. Uh, the uh, big task that he had was, tr was to try to stay out of the way of that heavier 
Japanese gunfire, and he executes a brilliant figure eight with his ships. Very difficult maneuver to, to execute, and that prevents our ships from taking any uh, that much damage. Uh, however, our gunnery is not at all good that day. It's been estimated by Samuel Elliott Morrison that out of the approximately 4,600 shells that were fired off by our four cruisers that day, they'd made something like 20 hits. That's not a very good batting average. However, the main thing is that we do keep the Japanese out of Empress Augusta Bay. The Japanese, just the w same way as uh, the Americans, uh, during a night action, it's very easy to go astray. You see a ship out there and there's a flash and suddenly you, you don't see the ship anymore. And it's easy to jump to conclusions that you're sending ships down and it's not really happening. Well, it's happening on both sides, but uh, fortunately the Japanese admiral decides that he's done a good enough day's work, breaks off the action, and to that extent alone, we can consider this a American victory because the Japanese are not pressing on to bombard our beachheads as happened to us at Guadalcanal. Well, comes the dawn and there's no rest for the weary because Admiral Merrill's uh, ships are being beset by an enormous swarm of Japanese planes like we haven't seen in the longest while. And they managed to fight them off and there would have probably been a further onslaught except for what we see here. And here's Rabal, uh, Rabal Harbor. And what you're seeing is, these are planes that are coming in from MacArthur's side. Until this point, MacArthur's Air Force under General Kenny has been responsible for the regular raids over Rabaul. And they're going in on this day, and just the way Merrill, you know, found himself uh, in a wasp nest, that is exactly what is happening to Kenny's planes. They take uh, uh, a very high number of casualties, uh, I think it was 16 or 18 planes. Uh, Kenny referred to it as the hardest fought battle of his 5th Air Force during the war. And this is what has happened. The Japanese, before they knew when Bougainville was going to be invaded, had made a decision, let's beef up our air forces around Rabaul. We're not going to need our carrier planes for a while. They send 173 of their carrier planes with some of their best pilots to Rabaul to buttress their air forces. And this is the reason uh, why we uh, 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 run into such heavy opposition. This will turn out in the longer run to be a rotten, rotten decision on the part of the Japanese because those planes are sitting out on those airstrips day after day. They're going to be suffering tremendous attrition and by the time the Japanese realize the extent that they have shot themselves in the, fo in the foot and they have pulled those planes back to their carriers, the damage has been done. And just three weeks after Bougainville invasion, Admiral Nimitz in the Central Pacific inaugurates the Central Pacific Offensive with the invasion of Tarawa and the Gilberts. The Japanese fleet is in no situation to contest the, uh, the situation they're going to need a long rebuilding period, and by the time they do rebuild, you get the Battle of the Philippine Sea and what's known as the, Philipp as the uh, Marianas Turkey Shoot, when the, the, this new generation of Japanese planes and pilots is nothing at all like what they had before. So they've done tremendous damage to themselves. And this is a very interesting uh, event, you know, the ramification up in the Central Pacific to what occurred down here, the decimation of the Japanese air. Uh, aircraft down here. Uh, when you read about the war in, in general, it's very easy to lose sight of the fact that uh, these our war fronts really interlock. And you do have, you know, th ramifications that are happening one place that uh, uh, from events that are happening elsewhere. And we'll see a similar thing happening just a little later on in the discussion. And now we will come to what Halsey called his most desperate emergency in his entire 20 months in the South Pacific. The Japanese at truck have sent down a force of seven heavy cruisers to attack our beachhead and any shipping that they might encounter. Halsey has no firepower that can match that. What he does have, however, are two carriers, Saratoga and Princeton, commanded by the most aggressive of our carrier admirals, Admiral Ted Sherman. We know the Japanese are going to have to put in at Rabaul to refuel, 
and that will give us a window of opportunity. Now we can't expect to catch them completely flat-footed. They do have radar. Uh, they do have very formidable uh, defenses around the harbor, and they have all those, uh, those planes that are still there, including, the, as I say, including those carrier planes. Uh, it's a very, very desperate gamble. Halsey has written that he's thought that he might lose both of the air groups as well as the ships. But uh, he goes, has little choice except to go ahead with the gamble. And here we have the scene at the left is what it looks like from the aircraft of Commander Henry Caldwell, who is coordinating the entire attack from an aircraft high above the harbor. He's got a couple of wingmen with him, and he's getting on the mic, and he's making sure that his uh, flyers down below are going after those heavy cruisers, because you see, you see lots of shipping down there, but we don't want to waste our shots against anything other than those heavy cruisers if we have a cruiser target. Uh, to give you a sense of what it looks like from a dive bomber up at the right, you have the scene from one of the dive bombers coming in on the heavy cruiser, Chikuma. The raid will take something like 25 minutes. We lose, incredibly, only about 10 aircraft. Uh, the Japanese uh, take rather heavy hits. Uh, four of the heavy cruisers are badly damaged to sustain lighter damage, and only one of them comes through pretty much unscathed. So it's a tremendous victory, and we have thwarted the Japanese. There's no way that they can continue on their mission after that. Here we have the planes returning to Saratoga. And we'll start with the picture on the right. That is uh, Commander Henry Caldwell hopping out of his aircraft. You see the plane is tilted over. He's come in on one wheel, plus no flaps, no aileron, no radio. Down below, you see what they are doing. They are removing the body of the photographer. Japanese uh, saw those planes up there. They knew that they were acting as uh, to controlling the event. And the Japanese you know, really went after him and after his wingmen. Miraculously, they all made it back full holes, but they all didn't make it back to the carriers. In the picture at the left there is the turret gunner from the same aircraft. His name is Kenneth Bratton. We know that Bratton is going to make a full recovery from his wounds because later in the war there's a wonderful photograph that shows Bratton back in uniform and looking at a blow up of this now iconic photo. At the, at the upper left we have a very happy uh, carrier admiral, uh, Ted Sherman, and he is being uh, apprised of the results of the raid by his very colorfully uh, nicknamed uh, fighter commander, Jumping Joe Clifton, who as a matter of fact took down one of the uh, Japanese planes during that uh, action. Uh, Halsey flies up to meet the carrier when it pulls out of the war zone, and there again you have Jumping Joe with a very happy Admiral Halsey, whose, uh, uh, whose bet certainly paid off here. And now we've been through two great naval actions. And now we are going to have another one, and it's going to involve someone who is not yet famous, but certainly will be later, and right here on the bridge of the destroyer Charles Osborne is Arleigh Burke. Burke at this stage of the war is in command of destroyers. Uh, they, their nickname is the Little Beavers, this Little Beaver insignia, and those who remember the old Red Rider comic strip will remember Little Beaver as a little Indian boy. Uh, Here's a nice painting showing, oops, it didn't work, yes. Here are some of the little beavers in action, and their great day is very auspiciously going to occur on Thanksgiving Day of 1943. Up till this point, the Japanese destroyer men have pretty much ruled the waves when it comes to clashes between their forces and our forces on a, uh, in most, well that is going to end abruptly on this day. Hall, uh, Burke is going to be leading four destroyers against four Japanese destroyers. We'll send three of the enemy destroyers to the bottom without loss. This is the Battle of Cape St. George, and it's still a classic that I think is still taught about in the Naval Academy. So now we have now had three great naval victories, all during the same month of November 1943. 
Well, meanwhile, what's been happening on shore? And it's this, mud and lots of it. We discover that uh, there is this uh, uh, vast swamp that lies just immediately beyond the beaches. We did not know it until we got there. And that, you know, it makes you, it makes you wonder. But there's one reason why there weren't that many Japanese there, because I think they, they, they said, well, who's going to want to go land here? Well, all in all, it was not the most pleasant place. I, I, I quote one Marine who was in all sorts of nasty places during the war. But he said, just for sheer living conditions, there was nothing as bad as, as uh, Bougainville. Bougainville was sheer hell. And here we have, beginning up at the upper left, here is Admiral Halsey, who's flown to Bougainville uh, about 10 days after the landings. Uh, at the upper left, you, you can see, uh, I don't know if, how well you can see it, he has his shirt off to show off that nice anchor tattoo that goes back to his days at the Naval Academy. In uh, the picture at the right, here he is talking with the, his commanders, and here is the man who has now taken over IMAC. That is Roy Geiger. Geiger is very unusual in that up to this point he has been an airman. He was the one who commanded our air forces on Guadalcanal. Uh, and then after, afterwards he had been whisked off to Washington. He was sitting behind a desk, but he's just a natural fighter. And it was just intuited correctly that, boy, he could make a great ground commander, too. And he makes a truly great ground commander. Uh, by the end of the war on Okinawa, he takes over the 10th Army when the Army General is killed. And that is the highest command that a Marine has ever had and probably ever will have. Wonderful, wonderful commander who should be better known in our pantheon. Uh, and then down here at the bottom, here is Geiger again with Halsey, and they're watching the, this marching past of army troops. We are, uh, have uh, the Ohio National Guard 37th Division that has come to Bougainville to operate along with the Marines. Because the idea is we are only going to keep the Marines in there long enough to do their business and then get out. We're not going to keep them in too long the way we do at, did at Guadalcanal and really wore them down to the bone. Here is a typical Japanese position, and it's not that easy to see, but here you can see the, the bar of a, of a machine gun peeking out of one of their positions, and in the other picture you have one such position that is being taken out with flamethrower. And we acquire some very valuable four-footed allies. We have had war dogs before, but never on such an organized basis as on Bougainville. These are uh, mostly Doberman pinchers, some German shepherds. One German shepherd, appropriately named Caesar, acquitted himself very courageously in battle, was wounded, got a commendation from the Marine Commandant, and a promotion from PFC, which all the dogs were to start with, to sergeant. And I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how, how he spent his extra pay, but uh, that was his business. And here we have some very tired looking Marines. They're coming back from one of the many engagements. And in my book, I go through all these individual battles that they are fighting. And what they're doing is they're carving out a secure perimeter to enclose both the Tarakina airstrip that we saw earlier, plus two additional airstrips that we have decided that we are going to construct there. And one of our last battles there, and this is, here we are in the middle of December of 43, and one of the last battles was known as the Battle of Helsipapen Ridge. And coincidentally, it was fought just around the time when we had finished that, that uh, Cape Tarquina, the first of the airstrips, and we were actually able to land planes there and have them go off on one of the, one of the shortest bombing missions of World War II to, to attack Japanese, just a, almost a stone's throw away, and uh, they did materially help to uh, win the position. Well, we have now reached the point where the Marines have pretty much accomplished everything that they were interested in doing on Bougainville. So we pull them out and the Army will take over. Uh, and the air campaign can now begin. 
Here we have some pilots running out to their Corsairs. And, and we use uh, the Corsairs, among other things, they use them both as escorts, but also we do fighter sweeps uh, as well over the Japanese airstrips. We try to lure them up and our planes can usually knock down a heck of a lot more than they can knock down of ours. So that's all part of their missions. And the best known of our Corsair pilots is, of course, this fellow, Pappy Boynton, hopping in his aircraft, and here he is with, uh, with uh, some of his men. Boynton is shot down in January of 1943, not 44, over a ball. A Japanese submarine fishes him out of the harbor. He's whisked off to Japan. We have no idea if, uh, uh, what's happened to him because the Japanese don't disclose that he's a prisoner. Uh, we award him the Medal of Honor during that time. And then uh, comes the end of the war and he is released from uh, captivity and he reports truthfully or otherwise, or we, we have no way of knowing for sure, that he downed two Japanese planes during that last mission. Uh, so uh, the, the air campaign is getting underway in earnest in uh, December of 44. It starts off very slowly. At first we're just putting lots of holes in the Japanese airstrips and they are filling them in as fast as we can hold them. Uh, when we get into January uh, we are seeing some more substantial results and we get into February and we can really see the light at the end of the tunnel but we're still getting some very very you know strong opposition. The last big air battle over a ball is fought on, fe in, on February the 19th of 1944 and then abruptly the air war in the South Pacific essentially ends because you get another one of these seismic effects such as what I had described earlier. In this case it was happening up in the Central Pacific at Truk in the Carolyn Islands. Admiral Mark Mitcher has conducted on February 17th a devastating carrier attack on the Japanese base. He destroys lots of the Japanese shipping and even more important than that he destroys a tremendous number of aircraft including many that had been destined to be brought back down to the South Pacific and they were just waiting for somebody to ferry them down. And the Japanese have now had to make a decision. They cannot hold everywhere and they realize it. They're going to have to give up the South Pacific. They've already decided certain areas are more more crucial for them than others. So something has to give and it's the South Pacific that's giving here. They pull out their aircraft or almost all their aircraft from the South Pacific. And then on top of all that and for this I'll have to use the other map as I said, the last big air battle was on February the 19th. On the last day of the month, and we have leap year there, so actually we're talking on February 29th. On February 29th, right here in the Admiralty Islands, MacArthur's forces that have worked their way up here, move here into the Admiralty Islands, and MacArthur says, that will put the cork in the bottle. And you can kind of see what he meant by it. His forces have come up here, Halsey's have come up here, we have been encircling them, and now we have covered the, the top part. Now, is that the end of the war in the South Pacific? Absolutely not. There's another year and a half of the war still to go. The war in the South Pacific will go on for another year and a half. That is usually the point where most writers will break off. They lose interest in the South Pacific, but I find lots and lots of interesting things are happening from here out. As I said, the army has taken over, and here we have the army High Command. Uh, there's Harmon behind the wheel of the Jeep. You may remember him in that photo sitting uh, next between Halsey and Barrett. Uh, Harmon commanding both the Army and the Army Air Forces in the South Pacific. Next to him is Nathan Twining uh, who commanded the 13th Air Force until during the Battle of Bougainville. He moves to Europe takes over air forces there, and some of you may remember Twining as being a uh, uh, chief of staff uh, in the uh, years after World War II. Uh, the gentleman in the middle of the photo in the helmet, that is Oscar Griswold. Griswold commands the 14th Army Corps, and it's his troops that are now manning the perimeter on Bougainville. And if you're interested in knowing who the fourth gentleman in the Jeep is, he is one of our great unsung heroes of World War II. 
Here he's a colonel, later on he becomes General Breen, who has responsibility for coordinating all supply in the South Pacific, a horrendously difficult task, which does not get the credit it should. And here we have the two division commanders under Griswold. At the left, this is General Beetler, commanding the 37th Division Ohio National Guard. Beetler is very unusual. He is the only Army National Guard general who is allowed to retain command of his division throughout the entire course of the war. And uh, for the, that reason alone, you know that he must be a very able individual. Uh, the other is General Hodge. Hodge is commanding the Americal Division that has now joined the 37th Division on the perimeter. Uh, he uh, will rise to become a corps commander later on during the Philippine campaign and in the later after war years he'll actually move up to become an army commander. Two very able men and they will be facing this gentleman this is General Hiyakutaki. He was the commander on Guadalcanal who was forced off, forced to evacuate by Admiral Halsey and he would like nothing better to do than have the Americans, uh, as a matter of fact, he is so confident of success, he has his maps marked to show where the Americans are going to surrender to him. Uh, what he manages to do is really quite remarkable given how primitive the jungle trails are and the fact that he has, at the very end, no air or naval support. He manages the greatest concentration of Japanese infantry and artillery that will fight at a single place in the South Pacific. And you can leave it to the Japanese to never do something with ease if it can be done with difficulty. They are very good at coming up with the most complex of plans. And for their initial blow, they have selected this point on our perimeter. It's known as Hill 700. And you can see from the steepness of that hill, that is one hell of a hill. Uh, but the way the 37th Division historian wrote about it, uh, it was hard to, to hit an enemy that was hiding almost literally under the front lines. You couldn't depress your, uh, your guns enough to be able to hit them while they were gathering at the, at the base of the hill. Well, during one dark and stormy night, they come up the hill on all fours, which is about the only way you can, you can do it, uh, with their rifles slung across their backs. They, by sheer weight of numbers, they break into the front lines of the 37th Division, and then those Ohioans have the fight of their lives on their hands. Now most of the battle is taking place on the 37th Division front, except here, uh, this is not actually on the perimeter. This is a hill in advance of the perimeter, it's called Hill 260, and what makes it special is that enormous banyan tree that you see at the left, from which you can just about see everywhere. The Japanese seize it early on in the action, seize the hill early in the action, and they hold on to it. And we, we try every which way to try to win it back, and we don't succeed. Some wag referred to that tree, uh, referring to the blood that was expended for it as the most expensive tree in the world. Well, that tree does not look like it's worth very much comes the end of the battle, and you can see the bare remnants uh, that are left there. Again, that's on the Americal front, but all the other action is happening by the Amer on the okay here on the 37th division front here are the troops in action and here you see something that you'll not oh wait a second went too far something that you do not see very often here is the division commander Joan Beetler with a rifle in hand who's gotten right into the battle and he wrote a letter to his wife saying all the fun that he had in a battle that he, had, you know, <laughs> I shot people from uh, some, so many yards away and all. And his commanders were not at all thrilled about having their division general acting like a second lieutenant. And they, they told him that, but they gave him a silver star anyway. Well, we are, we, we are now very late in the battle. The Japanese have been losing very many men in fruitless attacks because we are along most of our front, very, very well defended because we know sooner or later the Japanese were going to be arriving uh, and uh, we rebuff them and then at the very end of the action we unloose a tremendous artillery barrage 
and they go limping away and they will never again be a serious offensive threat on Bougainville. And now for the next many months, here we were in March of 44. When you get right all the way down into December, there's hardly anything happening there. We own as much of Bougainville as we're interested in owning. The Japanese are certainly in, not in any position to attack us anymore. They are con content to just cultivate their gardens and try to stay alive till the end of the war. And during this uh, period, you get a experiment. And these are African-American troops from the 93rd Division. Now, if the army was left to its own devices, it probably would have uh, not try this experiment to see if these troops might be used in combat. Uh, pressure had come down from the White House, it was an election year, and uh, it was what they decided to do is they would take the troops company by company out into the jungle and acclimate them, and from there they will it was somebody referred to it as it was like a Klieg lighted atmosphere. They really had it under the uh, microscope to see uh, how they would perform. Well, the uh, experiment went on until what was called the Company K affair. It was one company uh, that just came up against a handful of Japanese and they pretty much folded up shooting at each other and it was a great mess. Uh, there were lots of reports, full scale investigation and in consequence uh, it was, the experiment was closed down. However, there were other African-American troops on Bougainville who we see right here, and these are men in the, 20, from the 25th Infantry Regiment. And they acquitted themselves very nicely. Their situations were very different. And what it really boils down to, I think, is that there was only one solution to the problem, and that is an integrated army, and that had to wait till the end of the war. Uh, the situation was very complex, and you get too many simplistic books that are written about the situation during the war. We were very lucky that a very able African-American historian named Ulysses Lee wrote one of the volumes in the official army history called The Employment of Negro Troops. And he went into the whole worldwide situation with tremendous objectivity, and it oh, makes wonderful reading still after these many years, and if you own a computer, you own the book because every one of our official histories, the Army official history, the Marine official history, the Air Corps official history, not the Navy, but those are all, have all been digitized and they're all available on your computers. And now we will be going into what I consider the most tragic phase of the entire war in the South Pacific. And I say this because Warfare is bad enough, but sometimes it's something you gotta do. This time, we don't have to do it. And as far as I'm concerned, the villain of our story is right here. This is Australian General Blamey. Very controversial figure for, on many scores. He is clearly a very able uh, individual as far as military talents. There's also a very brutal aspect to him and also some rather unsavory aspects. He was. Uh, the chief of the British general staff uh, said about him that uh, one morning he looks uh, d entirely drink sodden as if he spent the most debauched night is the way he, uh, he referred to it, which is... Uh, but uh, in any event, Blamey makes the decision that this tacit truce that is set in between the Americans and the Japanese that has gone on for now many months, he is going to stop it and the Australians are going to go after the Japanese and he makes some very poor excuses that are in my book. Here we have the scene. Uh, that second figure from the right is uh, General Bridgeford, commander of the Australian 3rd Division and here he is taking over on Bougainville from the Americans. American troops uh, are wanted by MacArthur for his campaign in the Philippines. So he pretty much, this is happening not just here on Bougainville, but it's happening elsewhere in the South Pacific of the Australians taking over from the Americans. And most of these battles, uh, the situation is much as you see it. Uh, uh, in the picture on the right, these droves of, you know, whereas the Australians in most cases only take 
very few casualties, the Australians, the uh, Japanese, they've been cut off from all supply. Uh, they're in a semi-starvation state and uh, their casualties tend to be very numerous. However, uh, sometimes the Japanese can strike back very forcefully, as we see in the uh, picture at the left. Uh, this was an amphibious attack that was attempted by the Australians at a place called Porton Plantation. Uh, it went completely awry, and in my book I refer to it as a Gallipoli in miniature. Well, here you have very forceful looking Australian brigadier, very, very appropriately his name is Hammer. And Brigadier Hammer in this picture is explaining his plan of attack for the final battles to his higher echelon commanders. Uh, the uh, idea is we're going to be pressing on to the Japan main Japanese base at Buin at the south of the island. The Japanese have nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Uh, so knowing what the Japanese are like, we are, would have had one heck of a battle in those last stages. And we have pretty much the same thing going on on New Guinea, which I covered in my book. I've just been able to just focus in on one little period uh, area here. The uh, rain set in, fortunately, fortunately. And when things finally dry out, and it takes a while for the Australians to get organized for that last big push, Japan surrenders. The war is over. And here is the scene at Australian headquarters the man at the left who is signing the, the surrender is General Kanda uh, because General Hyakutake is still on the island. However, he suffered a stroke and in his incapacitated state, it was not possible to remove him because Bougainville has been completely cut off from the world. Uh, I found very interesting, oops, okay, I'll point to it. The second figure from the right. Uh, that is an American. His name is John Causey. And I was curious who John Causey was. I did a little look up and I'm discovering that he was a Marine who was aboard the, the Arizona on December 7th, 1941. And he was part of the minority that survived. When, when I brought this to the attention of the historical office at Quantico, they thanked me for it and they were specially notating the records. But that was an interesting little, uh, little something that occurred. Now, in closing, I don't think there's a danger by my giving away the ending, because I'd like to read from the last page of the book. <laughs> With the coming of peace in the South Pacific, each man needed to find peace on his own terms. Blamey left no question about his feelings when he presided over the capitulation of the Japanese Second Army in the Netherlands East Indies. He told the Japanese, in receiving your surrender, I do not recognize you as an honorable and gallant foe. But others felt differently. None of the Australian brigadiers was more fiercely anti-Japanese than Arnold Potts, who needed to be leashed in by Blamey in the final months of the war. Placed in charge of Bougainville and its prisoners, Potts ordered a full dress inspection that included 17 Japanese generals and 15 admirals. It was wondered how he would react. To everyone's surprise, at the conclusion of the proceedings, Potts exclaimed, good show, and he shook hands with the conquered. He would explain, quote, many dreadful things have been done during the course of the war by both sides. There should not be recriminations after the event. Once it was over, it was over. Thank you all. And any questions? Please, sir. Those two uh, things that uh, have me shot down, did I get them 26? Uh, I, think I've got, I think I've got it in the book. I can't, somehow it, it feels right. Does that sound right? It, that, that sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's quite an accomplishment. It was a, quite an accomplishment. <laughs> that, though I, I believe that, that he added in the, the, uh, the planes that he took out before he was with the Americans when he was uh, uh, flying with the flying tigers in China. And I think he, he threw those in as well. So it wasn't all with the American Air Forces. Uh, any, any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, just to kind of move things along, uh, 
you know, when you write a book like this, you know, it's very hard not to get invested to a certain extent uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the characters. Uh, Halsey, I have to admit that in terms of this period, Halsey is a great favorite of mine. He's a great favorite for only for this reason, that he does not get enough credit for these 20 months in the South Pacific. For those of you who don't know the Halsey's full story, what happens after the South Pacific uh, is pretty much subjugated uh, in June of 1944. He moves on to command ships again. He starts out the war in command of ships, and the, during this interim period, he's just sitting behind a desk at Noumea. He goes back aboard ships, and uh, two bad, th or actually, may I should say three, uh, he uh, allows uh, uh, the Japanese to uh, almost infli to inflict tremendous losses on us at Lady Gulf that, that could have been avoided. Uh, he's lucky because net-net at the end of the battle we still are coming out ahead, so there's not too much of a fuss that is made during the war. Uh, however, our fleet gets caught later in two typhoons. Well, it's bad enough to get caught in one typhoon, but by the time he's caught in the second typhoon, uh, there, uh, there's a uh, court of inquiry, uh, and it's presided over by a very hard-nosed individual named uh, Genial John Hoover, because he was anything except Genial, and he, he wanted to sack uh, Halsey. Uh, Admiral Nimitz, appreciating his fine services earlier on in the war, said, no, we can't have that, and particularly since the war is winding down. So that does save Halsey, but, but uh, these are dark clouds that hang over his head and hang over his head among historians who are too ready to not give full cognizance of this one period where he is just absolutely doing an amazingly good job. I can't even hit, hit on every aspect uh, he was. So uh, it's very interesting that in the magazine that I write for, Naval History, uh, there was someone else, Richard Frank, a very fine writer, he had to assess our different Navy commanders, and he went right down the line in terms of were they, were they uh, superior, average, or inferior. He had to chop Halsey in half. He had to take, take <laughs> the, the pre-mid-1944, pre Halsey gets the highest marks and the low marks for the second half of Halsey. So uh, you just can't, uh, uh, you can't just look at somebody and just make a, a too much of a flat-out uh, judgment. Sir, you had a question. Yeah, what were the casualty numbers for uh, the entire Bougainville from the Japanese and for the Americans? Uh, I think that I, I'm pretty sure that I do have the numbers, including the Australians. That they're in my book. If, if you come up here, I think I can, I can show them to you. The Japanese, uh, the point I, I make about the Japanese uh, casualties is that Bougainville uh, has some of the highest, ca you know, if you compare it against battles like Saipan or others, higher profile battles. Uh, a lot of them are, are not dying in battle. A lot of them are dying just through malnutrition and, and just because it's a very insalubrious environment there. Uh, but the, uh, the Japanese, as I recall, I think their, their casualties are roughly the same during the, uh, uh, the Australian phase and the American phase. And if you come up here, I think I can lay my hands on them pretty quickly. Uh, further questions? Yes, sir. Uh, the airstrips, uh, were they built by uh, construction battalion, maybe? Uh, yes, yes, and there were, there were three in total. Uh, there was the one at Cape Turquina, and then the, uh, the two additional strips that were built. Did a great job. Yes, sir? It was interesting. I was in Japan in the early 50s, and they had a train came through on the station, and it was loaded with trucks that had been used in World War II. Uh -huh. and we were taking them back into the woods of Japan and carrying them all the time. Uh -huh. like, no. uh -huh. But it was the Japanese who went back and got them. Went back and got those. <laughs> the attitude of the Japanese yes. is so much different. We just left France. They were throwing stones at us in France, southern France. Mm -hmm. We thought, what's going to happen to us when we get to Japan? Mm -hmm. and we got there, the people oh. were like, the life, yes, the Japanese tend to be very obedient, and if the government says uh, <laughs> obey, they will, they will obey. And, uh, One thing when I was in yes, Tokyo, I took a taxi cab, and my friend had made some remark about uh, General uh, MacArthur. Mm -hmm. The cab driver pulled right over the cab, 
Get out. <laughs> 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 I hope it wasn't a really isolated place. <laughs> He's still out there. <laughs> okay, are, are we there yet? Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all.